Hi, back again. Still trying to work on the preface of Wisdom is Bliss. Four friendly fun facts that can change your life. And it's been a few weeks, but I realized that I had reached page XIII 13 in the preface. And I'm, I'm saying, I'm starting with the paragraph, it is important to realize that the Buddha was not teaching Buddhists. <laughs> That's the funniest thing. People never even think of that. Why? There weren't any Buddhists when the Buddha started teaching. There was just a bunch of Shakyas and Magadans and, and Indian people in, uh, in the 6th century BCE. Actually, in Kalachakra time, they say it was the 9th century BCE, three or 400 years earlier. Uh, but uh, two or three hundred years earlier, but uh, never mind. Nobody really knows exactly. I think it's the earlier century is probably correct, personally, because I think it was the inspiration of the, it was in the same time as the earliest Upanishads, and uh, probably before Mahavira, because it was at the time when they were really expanding the different shramanas. The brahmanas were becoming shramanas, some of them. That is to say, the, the priests cast the ritualists, the Brahman, which were the brahmanas, who were doing the power of the Vedic wonderful ritual. And Brahma had not really was just emerging as a se separate god, like a god of gods, a, a, a creator god, uh, from the old Vedic Indra and other people like that, beyond the old Vedic Indra and so on. And it was around that time that the Buddha came up with, uh, with uh, the fruits of the seeking, the shramana, the going to take a vacation, being tired of the worldly life and looking for something higher, and finding the idea of individual liberation, individual freedom as every individual's right to pursue. And that, that idea was shattered, the sort of cosmic egg the Hiranyagarbha, the golden egg, the golden womb, golden egg, in which the Vedic society was supposed to be encased, where you were just part of a whole, but as an individual you didn't. It was a collectivism of a kind. Okay, so anyway, it is important to realize that the Buddha was not teaching, so page XXX, line 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, yeah, that the Buddha was not teaching Buddhists, quote, unquote, as there weren't any at that time. He taught all kinds of people who had grown up devoted to Vedist gods, Brahmin priests, and texts quite able to satisfy both mundane and spiritual concerns. Yet many of those same people were inspired by the Buddha's example and quickly found his teachings useful, in a way I could say his coaching useful, in their living practice. Since he said, just by understanding something he said, you wouldn't necessarily get there, but by putting it into your mind through analysis and inner debate and inquiry and meditation, uh, then it would really make a change in you. So he's like a coach of what you do, coming to understand it yourself, in other words, rather than just repeat some dogma that he says. Many men and women were moved to enroll full-time for his triple super-education, the super-education in ethics, super-education in mind, super-education in science, in wisdom, in the knowledge of reality. And they dropped out of their various life professions and became, within the Vedist uh, caste culture, and became mendicant seekers. That mendicant means they go out and get free lunch from people, they beg a lunch. So they don't have to spend waste time working just for subsistence. And the society had the wealth to support them, being the wonderful Indian alluvium, you know, the, the uh, tremendous uh, Ganges and uh, Yamuna and all those great rivers. Fortunately, enabled to do so by the wealth and generosity of their societies, and because there were many different small nations, city-state nations at that time in India. They were, it wasn't just one Indian nation. They were supported with free lunch scholarships, what I call, quote, free lunch, unquote, scholarships, <laughs> 
by generous lay sponsors, kings and commoners alike. To keep it practical, they asked for brunch, not breakfast or dinner. And they vowed not to create their own families, but to adopt all beings as their relatives and their children. So they didn't add to by just breeding, they didn't add to the population of mendicants. They just, uh, they became everybody's family member in that sense. Now I, so that's really, that's a very brief thing about the history. I could go on about it, but I won't. So otherwise it would be forever. So to go on, I am not yet a Buddha myself. That should be very clear. You know, when people claim, to, when they give a book, write a book on physics, they don't claim to know everything about physics. They claim to be a physicist if they have a degree or they do, and they do experiments and they do mathematics relating to that. And they claim, therefore, to have some insights, but they don't claim to be the physical world. <laughs> Whereas a Buddha is defined as a being that has become omniscient in the sense of they are everything that you can possibly know. They identify with all beings and also with all things. So they know they are one with the trees, they are one with the buildings, they are one with the rocks, with the air, with the wind, with the fire, with the water, with the oceans, with the cosmos, the solar system, the sun, the moon. No limit, not just even the, just the planet, no limit, a Buddha is. So Buddha is lives on infinite planets, actually, by definition. It's a very preposterous for a materialist claim, I have to realize. But it is, that is the claim of what a Buddha is. It's, it's something also more than a god, a god who is locally creative in a certain context, for example, but still thinks they are a being that is separate from the rest of the world and is not infinite. Whereas the Buddha has become one with an infinite energy <clears throat> that is omnipresent, and omnitemporal. So it's, it's all time and space, being like that, and therefore knows everything by being everywhere and every when. And I know that's preposterous, but that is the claim. And uh, you can only verify that by trying to do it. And if you go in any direction, any distance toward that, you will know that it's possible given infinity of time, and that is to say, when we say eternity, we think of something that's out of time, that's in some other place that doesn't have time, rather, but rather infinite time, what can you call it? Is that eternity? I don't know. Eternity, A, means out of. So infinite time would be all past, beginningless past moments and all endless future moments. So it's not quite outside of time, it's including all of time. Okay, so it's a, I don't think we have a word for it, actually. Omnitemporal. Omniphysically present and omnitemporally present. Okay, so, so anyway, so I don't, it's not hard for me to claim I'm not one, since I think I'm Bob Thurman most of the time. Sometimes I'm not sure. <laughs> actually, every time when I fall unconscious and go to sleep, I don't think I'm Bob Thurman. And in dreams, not necessarily. Anyway, I am not yet a Buddha myself, but I am inspired by his example to trust that I will become one someday in the future, which will then, for me, be now. Fortunately, that's a very important point. You know, that's like, you know, Eckhart Tolle with his power of now. <clears throat> Even if it's a future time in respect to what I think now is, at that time it will be now. Right? But that will be a different now, because that now will include all other nows, because that's a Buddha now. It won't just be separate from the, this moment of the past. Uh, I'm, I'm in, uh, that's what I get to at the end of this book in more detail. Fortunately, he gave us a curriculum, which I have learned a bit about and will open up for you in this book. It is a path of education for anyone. You need not be Buddhist. As I said, the first people who heard about it from him were not Buddhist. He was not a Buddhist. You need not be religious. He was rebelling against the religion of his time, actually, which was a Vedist, Vedism. I don't, it's not like modern Hinduism. It's really Vedism. 
You need not even be spiritual. In fact, although that's, you, you should be open to there is such a thing as spirit. In other words, something a little beyond maybe even body and mind, something ineffable. But a little open-minded, in other words, open-minded to a strong degree when we say spiritual, at least what we mean, open-minded and therefore really but somewhat altruistic because of identifying with other beings, not rigid in your own separate identity. Spiritual means like that. In fact, skeptics are most welcome because they're inquiring, they're doubting things. That's really good. That's the best kind. You do need to be a bit open-minded, yes, about the question of what is real and what is unreal. Like we think be the walls of this building, this room, the ceiling, the floor, the windows, the people, me, the lights, the book is real. And, it, and actually, we would agree, uh, Buddhist scientists, Buddhist philosopher scientists would agree it is real, but it has an only illusory reality. So it's a reality that has holes in it, you could say. It's unreal, which even modern scientists will agree, actually, materialists. Why? Because this is materially real. Yes, you would bruise yourself if you bang your head on the floor. You have a bruise on your forehead. But this is really made, this is really atoms. And an uh, x-ray machine can look through it. And uh, atom has mostly empty space and blah, blah, blah. So the hard wood at a certain level of reality, at a deeper level of reality, is more or less empty space with little things zapping around in it. And then quantum soup, you know, people go into all kinds of funny expressions. And the microverse, like Ant-Man goes in the microverse with his mother-in-law. <laughs> Very intense. So they would agree that this reality has, it has a reality at a level, but it's not the whole of reality as we think it is as we in our materialist culture think it is. Um, you do need, so what is real, what is unreal, you do, need, you do need to be willing to learn, to think critically and confidently, and question everything. Ultimately, you will need to experiment by cultivating both your own good sense and your own inner intuitive experience. So common sense, dealing with even in a practical way with this level of reality, intuitive experience that makes you realize, gee whiz, it's really atoms. So this is kind of illusion, illusory in a certain way. And then atoms are kind of illusory in another way because when you relate in this way with these kind of sense perceptions, then it's solid. It's not empty space with the electrons wrapping around in it. And then there may be something deeper. The quantum people say actually it disappears under analysis. The deeper ones, the pragmatic ones, say. You know, they talk about 11 dimensions and string theory and blah, blah, but they don't claim you can go grab one. So you cultivate both your own good sense in relation to conventional realities, let's call them, and your own inner intuitive experience of some deeper reality. After some learning, you will need to meditate and concentrate on examining the mental and physical realities within and without. Welcome to the path. I hope you are pleasantly surprised by how real and applicable these teachings can be. So here we go. And I wrote that on the great Iron Ox Great Miracle Full Moon, February 27th, 2021. Okay, and that's me, Robert A.F. Tenzin Thurman, previously teased in the academy by some students as, quote, Buddha Bob. <laughs> I should have been Bodhisattva Bob, but anyway, never mind. Now, the Buddha path, to go on, since we're not worrying about chapter breaks, and I'm not going to try to finish chapter one although it's only 14 or 15 pages long, but I'm not going to try to finish it in this one session because I'm really trying to bring this book to life with you and I'm doing like a commentary as I read a little bit of it. So the chapter one is called The Buddha Path and um, because that's what one embarks on is the Buddha Path. It's the fourth friendly fun fact. It's what's called the Eightfold Path that involves ethical, mental, and 
scientific wisdom training and uh, learning and training. And, uh, and so that's what, it, that's what this now tells about. So this book, so it's almost like another introduction in a way, but they're calling it chapter one. So this book is about getting real <laughs> while having fun along the way. That's different, isn't it? So getting real, be real, getting real. But people might think reality and fun are opposite, since you're supposed to be miserable in reality. But actually, no, what Buddha's announcement really was is that reality is bliss. That's, that's it's not just wisdom. Wisdom is bliss because it, wisdom is what knows reality. And, and the reason it's bliss is that reality is bliss. So when you know reality, you become reality. You become what you know. You follow. So that's why wisdom is bliss. But reality itself is bliss is actually the stronger claim. The third friendly fun fact is nirvana. And that's not a space outside of the world. Somewhere, you know. It's a place, it's this world as a different space, as a happy space, as a fun space. And that's a reality. The first noble, friendly, fun fact or noble truth was the truth of suffering. And that's when you misunderstand reality and you think this is the only reality and then it's never satisfying. And it's no fun. But the, but the, but the fun, reason, what makes even that a fun fact is by saying it's no fun, the reason you say it is because it can be fun when you understand it. And that's the point of saying it's no fun without understanding. You get it? And with your misunderstanding, then you think you're, you're in a fun, you have in a party and you're in a bad mood and you're f mad and pissed off or upset or whatever and you're not enjoying the party. That's, just, that's, that's really what Buddha's party is about. So the Buddha path. So it's about getting real while having fun along the way. I like, when I read it slow, I like each sentence, actually. Usually I don't like what I read, because I think, oh, I've got to get to the point, you know, You're rushing along, never appreciating where you are. Okay. Maybe you're supposed to hear, oh, maybe you're surprised to hear that things like Buddhas, enlightened persons, enlightenment, spirituality, or wisdom, have anything to do with reality. And even more astound, astonishing, with joy or even fun. You might think reality is dreadful. Joy is all too rare. And fun is childish. While the spiritual life is supposed to be terribly serious too. <laughs> you get it? We do think that way. So actually, in a way, when the Buddha, first friendly fun fact, the reason it's fun, another reason it's fun, because I had to defend when I said it was a friendly fun fact to some people who overemphasize the first noble truth. But actually, the first noble truth or friendly fun fact that, life, that the unenlightened life is suffering is actually just agreeing with what we think. It's fun because he's agreeing with us. Because we think that it's no fun. We die, we get sick, we feel pain. We, somebody, we don't like somebody, something. We, we want something better than this or that or the other. We think it's no fun. And we think people who are having fun are silly and in danger, actually. And when we feel a little like having fun, we immediately look around and see who's going to spank us. So he's just agreeing with us with the first noble, noble truth or friendly fun fact. And that's what makes it the beginning of the fun. <laughs> if you could still be unenlightened and stupid, you're going to have no fun. You're going to be unhappy. Okay? I agree with you about what I say. <laughs> okay? However, there's a reason for that. Now, oh, yeah, but we, never mind. I go. So, uh, so, let me start right off, since my life has had a lot to do with, quote, Buddhism, unquote which seems highly religious to people, by saying that what I am going to share with you is not the religion of, quote, Buddhism, unquote, the, quote, religion, unquote, of Buddhism, quote, unquote, but the experience of, oh, this is another one of my favorite lines, quote, Buddhism, unquote. Now, I'm purposely echoing the word orgasm there, 
because of course, even when we are having no fun, we do appreciate that brief moment of escaping from our no fun and immediately being dissatisfied with whatever it was. <laughs> Smoking a cigarette or something in the old days, lighting up uh, waxing post postcoital philosophical or irritable or whatever. But, but, but nevertheless, that orgasm is where the organism lets go of itself and feels beyond itself. And that's what we, that, and therefore that becomes thought of as a point of fun. So Buddhism is where the awakening, the enlightenment, the, the touching of reality, the being real in reality, becomes joyful and fun. That's Buddhism. Okay. By the way, an awakening is, is, is uh, well, some people want to only translate Buddhahood or Buddha as awakened one. And there they are falling short of the brilliant Tibetans who changed their whole life and society and culture when they encountered in India Buddha. And uh, who translated Buddha as Sangye. Sang means cleanse. And it means to, and can also mean awaken from sleep. So that is awakened. But ye means expanded and to bloom and blossom. And so what that means is to expand over all reality and take hold of it and be it. So they have the awakening side and the enlightening side. So awakened and enlightened, because you can awaken and be miserable. You can awaken and be stupid. And you can awaken and hurt yourself. So awakening by itself, in fact, sometimes is really pain, because you have to run off somewhere, your alarm went off, and you awaken. And re really, you know, you were happy or sleepy. <laughs> right? So I don't like it when they, they, they don't like enlightenment. Enlightenment is wonderful. And also, it by connecting it to the materialist enlightenment of the 17th centuries and on, it's to giving credit where credit is due to Westerners who were so crazy and were oppressed by such an oppressive type of religion, the Inquisition, and the torture and burning witches and horrible, uptight bunch of stuff, that uh, they rejected it, and the only way they dared reject it was to be materialist and say, well, okay, God made a material world, since you say he's the creator, so th that must be something good, so let's explore it. And don't tell me something about how I have to fear a sadistic God is going to throw my soul in heaven because I had a little fun. I don't want to hear about it. That's Shelley and Keats brilliantly said, the great poets. All right? So, so enlightenment is very good. I'm all for enlightenment. So the full, but the experience of Buddhism, the full release into joy that happens when we come face to face with the real reality, which we call the clear light of bliss void. The clear light of bliss or the clear light of void, voidness, which is same. Emptiness and bliss. Emptiness and bliss are the same. Okay, openness and bliss. Our goal here is not to believe in Buddhism, quote unquote, not to, quote, be religious, unquote, not to join a cult or subscribe even to a theory. Our goal is to gain the clarity of mindful awareness, that is, of what's going on inside us and outside us, and the joy of real freedom realizing that we are free to choose how we're going to react and, inter and interact with, with our, what we're interconnected with, which is ultimately everything and, and relatively here and now what's around us and who's around us and when's around us. So we are free to choose which way we do, and that's joy, that's, that's part of openness. We can choose no matter what our religion, our belief system, our cultural membership is. I call that deep experience of encountering real reality and being 
really free in the midst of it all, seeing the freedom in everything as well, uh, deeply, or just in a flash, and losing it as more usual. Uh, I call that a Buddhism. And yes, I purposefully associated with an orgasm, the blissful transport that every animal approaches with fear and trembling, yet craves as a peak experience of life. Actually, there's a kind of death, the death process, the, death, the full death experience is a kind of orgasm, actually. In fact, if we really start examining human experience, as people are beginning to do now. Okay, of course, everyone makes a fuss about finding happiness or joy, but few make a virtue out of fun. <laughs> Enlightenment, quote-unquote, smacks of 17th and 18th century intellectuals like Descartes and Voltaire and the serious business of facing the universe, dismembering nature with scientific analysis. To be clear, what I mean with this term enlightenment includes that too, and honors it, actually. I, I should even say, or I didn't, but I should. But more importantly, is the, is the blissful fun of life with wisdom and love. Because if we, wisdom means you really know what the reality of life is. And when you do really know the reality of life, you love it. And you love every living thing, and you love yourself. And love is the all which love, which is the drive to fun. It's the drive to joy. It's the drive to bliss. It is the bliss, actually, which is the stronger drive than any other one. So, it's, so actually, it's the drive of bliss. You could even say. But anyway, so in, so it is an extraordinary state of awareness, which we will all definitely get to amazingly soon, even though some of us. Probably me, being stubborn and dense, might take me a hundred lifetimes from now, or a thousand. But when I get there, it'll be soon. It's just like uh, I am actually already old. Uh, but it seems to me if I can make a hundred or something, the 18 years will be a long time. But they're getting really less long, believe me. When I was 10 and then to get to 18, or when I was 12 and then to get to 18, that would, uh, to 20, that would have been, really seemed like a long, that really did seem like a long time. But now, the, those uh, the 18 years of me getting to 100 are shorter. Okay? So, so it would be now at that time, amazingly soon. So ser now, serious science. Now, okay, move to that. So that's, 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 that's good. I like that. I like that few paragraphs there. Okay, so now serious science is subheading here. Science stinks of chloroform. Labs and people in white coats mixing noxious chemicals, telling us we need to, we need surgery or radiation, making bombs, building computers that lock us into information overload, and end up with AI spewing humanity despising robots like the Terminator or the Cylons. But, unfortunately, Buddha was a, Buddha was a scientist for sure. So uh, that's funny, you know, uh, there's a Vidyadara is an expression in Sanskrit, and the great rishis and yogis and buddhas and even arhats are called vidyadaras. That is to say, holders of science. Dada means to hold. So vidya means to know, a, a, know, a knowing. So vidyadara, holders of science. So a vidya is a science. So I once was working with a Tibetan friend who was translating something with me. And I translated vidyadara rigs in in Tibetan as a scientist. And he said, wait, wait, what do you mean? Scientists, these people have long hair. They're wearing like, you know, like loincloths. And they're like naked, almost naked. And they're like yogis. And scientists always wear white coats. And they have little, little mirrors on their head. He was thinking of some doctor he saw in a hospital where they used to have that mirror, you know. <laughs> and, and, uh, I know what he meant. You know. But in Indian science, it's the inner science is those the greatest. 
the scientist is automatically a yogi. Actually, our scientists are too. They yoke themselves to their lab and their data and their uh, watching the computer screen or watching the thing bubbling or watching the animal behaving or something. They, they, are, they are really yoking their life energy and their time and their concentration to what they're investigating. And in that sense, they are yogis. And they're seeking the ultimate reality of it too. This is what yogi, yogis want to connect to ultimate reality. It's just they, uh, they, don't, they have different postures and they have different outfits because they don't really know, you know. So, so that's the thing. Now, Buddha was a scientist for sure. Some fun-loving moderns might think that the historical Buddha did show promise as a fun-loving young prince. His name was Siddhartha Gautama, and he had a royal throne, a glamorous harem, eventually a loving wife, and then a beautiful son. But then he seemed to go awry. He ran away, starved and tortured himself, and ended up a beggar, a professional beggar, actually, not just like an accidental one, a purposeful one. But actually, when the young prince gave up the pleasures of family life and his throne, and power and wealth and pleasure, he found the far greater pleasure of being a Buddha, a Buddhasm, a yeah, permanent Buddhasm, yes. Yeah. The great discovery of his enlightenment, the one that made him the most famous Asian person in world history, thank goodness, was that reality itself is bliss. In his very, brief, in his very first message, that Buddha, offering us the famous four friendly fun facts called noble truths at that time, he assured us that his third noble truth or fun fact, nirvana, bliss, that term I used before, enlightenment, is the only real reality of life and death, and therefore beyond life and death, but transforming life and death, actually not leaving out anything. He stuck to that message ever more explicitly through to the end of his 45-year teaching career. And I should really say, I should have said, and even now, when he's present as infinite subtle energy around us, caring for us still, and bringing on some kind of planetary relief to us, even in, even in our worst moment of trying to destroy the planet ourselves with our stupidity. So we're still there, is the point. Because once a Buddha, you're in all time. So you don't leave town. You're not like the Lone Ranger leaving the village after you save the people. Because there are always more people and animals to save. Animals are all people, by the way. Even the ones we're eating, they're still people while they're alive. Uh, the Buddha knew that he couldn't immediately announce that reality really is bliss. But have you noticed the grin on his face? <laughs> have you ever checked it out? Buddha's smile. Big S-E grin. Uh, they cut that out to editors. He has. Ah, he does. He's very cheerful. Buddha is very happy. When you become a Buddha, you have a weird experience first, where you seem to disappear, and everything else seems to disappear simultaneously. Then the disappearance disappears, and then everything is back. And this is the act of waking up and coming to know bliss. Not just waking up, but waking up and coming to know the bliss of everything, the bliss of reality. Even better, to fully know that bliss is to be that bliss. Such enlightenment is the bliss of experiencing yourself as actually made of light, pure light, effortlessly shareable with others. Such enlightenment occurs when you are completely aware of the reality of the world around you, good and bad while the blissful awakening supports your seeing all the gold and silver linings. 
You can thus connect soothingly to the tough side of life without getting overwhelmed by it. You would connect soothingly to those caught in the tough side. You no longer are, and you because it doesn't overwhelm you any longer. And you do, but you do so out of compassion. You don't leave. That's a big mistake that spiritual people often make because they're used to not having any fun. So they somehow think there should be a separate fun state with nobody in it. <laughs> Enjoying that fun in a way, but just the enjoyment itself. A true scientist, the Buddha was totally realistic. That's why at the moment of enlightenment, he broke out in a huge grin. He realized deathless bliss and expanded his being to identify with everyone and everything, everywhere and every when, while purposefully remaining present to others as seeming to be his good old self sitting there grinning under the Bodhi tree. <laughs> Deathless bliss is nirvana, total freedom from suffering, the blowing away of pain, the profound immersion in the reality real, the really real. It is totally good, the ultimately enjoyable experience, the blissful freedom from suffering of any kind, the timeless and timely freedom from death, in infinite life. It is really cool. It really is. You know, if it, if it exists. I can't say for sure because I don't pretend I'm there. But I've sniffed it. I've flashed on it. I've thought of it. I've both rationally and poetically sensed it where I'm sure it is there, and in a way, also on the way of negation, you know, by opening negation. Opening, when you open, you're negating closure, right? So by, through negation, which emptiness, freedom, openness, these are all negative words, opposite of something else. And by saying that, and then infinity, another negation, and infinite time, an infinite space. So if that's the only logical context is this total open openness, infinite openness, if that's it, then how can I say it's not the case that I can become that? I cannot. So in a way, that negation becomes the root of faith. As long as I don't allow a closure on some fake Oh, it's only this big or that big or that's the limit, which is completely irrational, actually. You know, the, the ostrich thinks when they put their head in the sand, if they really do, I don't know, it might be a legend, that they somehow escaped from having the truck run over their butt. Because <laughs> they, by fakely closing themselves in a dark hole in the ground, they think they've escaped. Meanwhile, their butt is flapping up there in the breeze with their, on their long legs, right? So the point is when, when some side, when some side, oh, it's only this universe, there's only so many stars, but there's nothing beyond that, that's ridiculous. They don't see beyond a certain distance, maybe, but that, they don't, they, they, the idea of a limit means there's something else beyond what you're limiting. So limit always has that's what's being enclosed and that's what's outside of the enclosure. So infinity is obvious. It's the default. And once that's the case, that you could become infinite yourself, given infinite time and effort and energy, is not excludable from possibility. That becomes the source of faith. Okay? Sounds good, right? So freedom from death in infinite life. I mean, it sounds really wild, but that's what it is. And, that, that, and that's also scary, by the way. When you're having no fun, 
Who wants infinite life? How many people are taking the Jack Kevorkian route? How many people are sadly, some young ones, passionate ones, sadly doing themselves in? How many people, the whole planet's elite, the climate criminals, are doing themselves and everybody else in? Just for some immediate thrill of the chase, of the game, of the multiplications. The money. So the death wish is huge. It's a proof that we wrongly, when we misunderstand reality, we don't enjoy it. Multi-billionaires should be having fun. They are not. They're all stressed out. Look at, look at Elon. <laughs> he has a great grin. And he has moments. And then he stresses, I've got to go to Mars. I've got to go here and there. I need to do more. I want to take Twitter. I want to vote Republican. I, want, I don't want to pay taxes. I mean, then he gets all stressed out because he feels this huge burden of the capital he has amassed. What is capital? Capital is people. Capital is, that's where Marx had a brilliant insight. I think his revolutionary ideas were asinine, but his, his sociology was brilliant. Capital is the frozen product of human effort and you know, combined, and then, then therefore it can be put back to generate more human effort. So it's like a kind of crystallization or a sublimation of human effort. So when you have huge capital, you think well, it was just something I own, but actually it's steaming there with wish to be re redeployed to be re-exerted for the benefit of, the, of other beings who are making such effort. It wants to move. It has a bursting with energy. So then you become its slave when you have a huge amount of it. And then you have to hire all sorts of people to, to uh, take care of it for you, and you're terrified they're going to steal it from you, in fact. And, actually, and, and, uh, and so you actually can't own it. And that puts you under stress. And the person who has just a moderate amount enough to eat and drink and be, say, give some gifts to his family and so forth, or her family, they are much happier than you. But because you misunderstand your life and your reality, you think the number, the abstraction, is the source of joy and happiness. Because you mistake what it is. Because you don't know what it is. You don't know what it is. Hey, Mr. S <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. I'm sorry. It's okay. So, sounds good, right? Okay, infinite life beyond death, freedom from death, you know, sounds good. The great fun of it is that you do not need to abandon all your many loved ones. You engage in your world joyously. When you wake up in this way, you effectively help everyone you encounter come to enjoy the very same bliss, which you see they already have deep within themselves. When you're enlightened, not just when you're rich, but when you're, when you're, when you're rich, you see they're poor. <laughs> and that makes you unhappy because they're unhappy. Because they also wrongly think the wealth will make them happy by itself, which it doesn't. All being, but when you're a Buddha, you see they all have the wealth of life, the wealth of reality that they are part of, that they are reality, which is bliss. But they don't know it, and they're ah, like that. All beings possess this same ability to wake up and become enlightened. They have the seed of enlightenment within them, the seed of openness. What a great discovery. So we dedicate the merit to quickly becoming a Buddha for the sake of all life, all living beings and all things in their live, alive environment, which has been created with huge effort by all sorts of living beings who have somehow willed themselves into this interactive mind field, spiritual field that is our glorious planet that we're desperately trying to escape by destroying, led by the climate criminals, the petropaths. So anyway, we dedicate the merit to them. We want to be able to help them, to free them. Thank you so much.